Hey, Coconut. So yes, I'm a firm believer that a pandemic has come and gone. Okay, we are moving into a period of endemic. It does not mean that the virus is gone. You, you can kind of see the new variant coming in. Possibly, you know, similar to the idea of how the common flu comes back every year with a new variant and then you need a new flu jab and then life kind of move on from there, right? So that is the reality that I believe it's here to stay. And some analysts out there are saying, or some virus analysts out there are saying that, you know, maybe this Omicron thing or Omicron thing uh, is actually a good sign because it's a sign that the virus may become less lethal but spreads wider. So it's becoming more and more like the common flu. Okay, but that's that's for them to talk about at least on where we are at. I would like to congratulate you that you survived two years of pandemic, all these pandemic lockdowns, these strategies that the governments are using and how it's affected our lives. Uh, it's a very, very real thing, right? So congratulate to you. Congratulations to me. We all survived these two years. And at this juncture, I feel like there are some things that we can come together to review and uh, distill some lessons from this pandemic period, especially financial lessons through this period of the pandemic. So welcome back. Good morning, everyone. I welcome you to another day with the Financial Coconut. In our podcast, we're debunking financial myths, discovering best financial practices, and discussing financial strategies that fits our unique life. You get it. Ultimately, empowering us to create a life we love while managing our finances well. My name is Reggie, your host, and aka your chief financial coconut. Today, we're going to do something simple. The world is coming to an end. No, no, no. <laughs> the pandemic is coming to an end. The year is coming to an end. And I would like to distill some of the lessons that we have. Uh, put together uh, through this pandemic period. Okay, so it's been two years of the podcast and also two years of the pandemic. So I hope you've learned some useful stuff and I thank you for staying around and spreading the podcast. So that's amazing. Uh, I've definitely learned a lot of stuff also, yes, because of all of you, because of your questions, your queries, your concerns, I've actually pushed into boundaries that I never thought I would be concerned about, right? So a lot of those things actually came from you guys because the truth is... If you're an individual, you only really care about what you need to care about or what you actually care about. But because of me and the relationship with you guys, with you coconuts, then it becomes a reality that, oh, you know, I need to learn all these other things. All right, so that's that's great. Great for you, great for me. And also, I've interviewed a lot of people along the way. Of course, now Andrew takes over chills, so that gives me a more bandwidth to do other things. But either way, um, this two years has been very, very insightful and quite a learning journey for me. I hope it has been a learning journey for you too. I mean, we went from <laughs> very, very geeky stuff about investments um, to some things that are a little too high level that some of you may feel a bit alienated. So I apologize for that. We're going to try to recalibrate the flavor of Tuesday's podcast. And uh, you, if you want to geek out, go to the other shows, right? We have a lot of new shows coming up and a lot of shows ongoing to share with you and to kind of meet you at different, different standards so that as you progress in your investing journey or as you progress on your personal finance journey, you get all these different places. Or we even went to the level of talking about some personal development stuff, like, you know, how do you communicate with people? What are your thoughts? How do you look at your goals and all that, right? So a lot of those things exist. And I think it's kind of like correlated at some level. Because uh, if you think about it, you want to manage your personal finance well, you got to first learn about yourself. You got to manage yourself, right? So I think that's all kind of put together. And so in this pandemic process, these two years, a lot of new things have happened to us, right? Uh, you've locked down, you cannot go out, you, you shrink your social circle, uh, you move on digitally, you know, you, you start to work anywhere you are and you see, you know, the stock market move, prices move around. Some people made a lot of money through this process. Some people may have lost some money. Some people are just like, uh, what's happening? <laughs> so whatever, whatever it is. And I'm pretty sure there are a lot of things that we can learn together. So today I'm not going to cover everything. I mean, the, the, I'm going to discuss three lessons, you know, but if you have any other things that you've learned, come to our Telegram group, share with us. Okay, so the first thing uh, through this pandemic that I have vividly recognized, and uh, you may have heard this on the podcast from time to time, uh, but this is the first pandemic lesson that I think we all can keep this vividly, okay, in a very clear fashion. And that is... We all have a repertoire of needs, but there are many mediums or many ways to go about meeting those needs. 
Okay, so this is something that I've been talking about for a very long time. I want us to move away from this idea of needs versus wants, okay? Because the problem with needs versus wants is the standard evil bucket problem, right? Where you put together a bunch of things like sports car, la, like condo, la, like handbag, la, like clubbing, la, like restaurant night. You put together a, a bunch of things that are kind of along the lines of uh, more luxury, more high quality of life or, or whatever, high quality of consumption, okay? Not say quality of life. Um, you, you put all these things together, you put them in a bucket and you call them evil. And in this evil bucket, you call it a want, right? And to me, I am trying to move very far away from this good versus evil kind of idea because it's firstly too simplistic and also there's a lot of moral judgment in this process. And I would say uh, it may even become a problem because it, it sets unnecessary boundaries where you will not cross, and in that sense, it limits your experience, it limits your understanding of things, it limits your progress on many, many levels. So all these good versus evil kind of uh, bucket segregation, I, I, I'm trying very hard to move away from a lot of these things. And I hope you're following with me. Okay, but the reality is we all have needs. We have a varied hierarchy of needs, okay? So, of course, uh, I'm borrowing Maslow's hierarchy of needs. You can go and read up about it. Um, don't come to me with the, oh, you know, some people dispute it. Of course, every scholar out there is disputing some theory, huh? <laughs> That, that's how they how that's how they establish themselves. Okay, so anybody that brings you some research, right? You can also take another research and throw back at them and that counters it. Okay, so it, it always exists. That is the scholarly world, and that's a different discussion. But just borrowing the commonly accepted Maslow's hierarchy of needs, you realize that um, some needs are higher order, right? Social acceptance, you know, relationship, love, actualization, all those things are higher orders. And a lot of these higher order needs, right, they tend to fall in the luxury bucket or the one's bucket, right? Um, having the iPhone, the latest iPhone, is, is, do you really need the latest features? Like, come on, even, even I'm using like iPhone 12, but, <laughs> or was it iPhone 10? Okay, whatever. I'm using one of the, the, late, the, the newer iPhones and I'm not using a lot of features. I didn't even know there are all these things. I bought a new Mac Air and I'm like, okay, there are all these new features. I don't know how to use them, right? So are you really buying the latest stuff to um, get all those gadgety experience and all these extra features? Some of you may be, but I do think that a lot of people, we just want to be trendy. You know, we want to be hip. We want to be socially accepted that way, you know, or we want to be the talk of the town or we want to be like, oh, my friends have, I also want to have. And what's wrong? There's nothing wrong with that, <laughs> okay? Because unless you frame something, you know, there is no right or wrong. Okay, so let's move away from moral ideas. Let's move away from those things. Um, but what is important to note is that given the mirage of needs, okay, all these needs that you have, there are actually a lot of ways to go about achieving it, right? Which is where the mediums come in, right? Or the ways to achieve the needs come in. And you see it, you see it very vividly during this pandemic, right? In the past, your social need requires you to, you know, meet your friends, hang out, and then you cannot, then what do you do? Or call or, you know, maybe the call, you know, when you call each other, uh, truth is the millennials, uh, actually, we, we, are, we, are, we have really went into the texting era, right? So it, it, the tendency for us is we text, right, rather than call. But a lot of people have actually tried calling each other, right? Whether is it phone call or online call or video call or whatever, FaceTime, right? And it is a way of achieving that need, that socializing need that we all have deep within, right? So it may not be the best medium, but it is a medium. So at least it helps you to go about achieving some of those needs. And then I'm sure for all of you in these two years, some friends may have, you know, send you some gifts, send you some pastries, send you some cakes or send you something here and there, you know, in this whole process of, of this pandemic and all delivery, right? So this is another medium of sharing with you that they love you, that they care about you, right? So, so I want you to kind of see this thing you know, where it is need plus medium. So based on your needs, you go and find a medium to achieve it and not need versus wants, okay? So by extension, with the clarity that is needs plus medium, you can always find a more pocket-friendly medium, <laughs> right? If, if your goal is to save some extra money or if your goal is to kind of uh, raise a little bit more capital over this year, there's always a more pocket-friendly medium, right? Which is more affordable. Um, community classes, right? A shout out to all the community centers out there in Singapore. It's amazing. Please go and use it, okay? It's very well run and there are a lot of uh, extra things there, right? So whether is it classes, whether is it a boba tea shop or whether is it, you know, what, what have you. So the community spaces are one of those very, very affordable uh, mediums that I don't know why Singaporeans are not using as much. So I would 
you know, highly encourage you to use it. Also, the public library. Right, I've said this again and again, NLB must sponsor me. And the public library has spent a lot of money and for all of you that didn't know, all the people that publish books in Singapore or sell any books in Singapore, you can find in the public library because to get a license to sell the books or publish the books in Singapore, you have to donate at least two books to NLB. Right, to get it vetted and confirmed and then you know, you're know you part of the ecosystem and then you can sell the books openly. Right, so recognize that and go and do it, right? Use the library, it's free and beautiful, right? So there are a lot of mediums that are more pocket-friendly that I think we can use. And, and to me, this is a very clear experience through these two years of pandemic as there are a lot of needs that we needed to achieve, that we needed to fulfill, uh, but the traditional ways that we go about doing it is not working. So we find new ways, we find new mediums to go about pursuing it and I want us to keep innovating and create new mediums or explore new mediums to achieve the varied needs that we have. Okay, sometimes to be a little bit more pocket friendly, lah, right? You don't, you don't always need the luxury stuff or the more expensive stuff. There are many other ways to achieve um, your needs. Which brings me to a point number two, pandemic financial lesson number two, and that is increased liquidity will definitely lead to inflation. Okay, you, you may not agree with me, but I will give you a little bit more clarity after a word from our sponsor. Okay, you may come to me and say like, oh, you know, Reggie, actually our consumer price index is not very high. Huh? The recent numbers, 1.5% or 2% or something like that, right? So we, we, we don't see runaway inflation. We're not seeing high inflation. And that is the problem. <laughs> that is the problem because the indicator in itself is different when you see it across all the different countries. The US have a certain way of measuring inflation. Australia has a certain way of measuring inflation. Singapore has a different way of measuring inflation. And I lead you to the MAS website, okay? Just go and look at how they measure inflation. Allow me to read you a paragraph from the MAS website, okay? In one of their documents. Huh? So CPI, Consumer Price Index. The CPI is commonly used as a measure of consumer price changes in the economy. It tracks the changes in prices of a fixed basket of consumption goods and services commonly purchased by the general resident households over time. The CPI covers only consumption expenditure incurred by resident household. This is the first thing. Huh? And it excludes non-consumption expenditure such as purchase of houses, shares or other financial assets and income taxes. Okay, so I'm not, I'm not blaming MAS. I'm not saying anything, but I'm just wanting to point out to you that in the media, you keep hearing inflation, 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 right? But the media is led by the US media. And they measure inflation in a very different fashion. But in Singapore, we measure it in, without house. Huh? That means your HDB not counted, your property not counted, your shares not counted. And the Angmos that live in Singapore, no matter how they spend, not counted also. Right? Also, now, now there's a lot of Chinese and Indians and, and a lot of Asians, uh, wealth, wealthy Asians that live in Singapore. However they spend is not counted. But however they spend will spill into effects in Singapore's life. Okay, in Singaporeans' life. You start to see enclaves, right? Rich enclaves. Uh, but that's a whole discussion another day. But I specifically want to point out that why I say an increase in liquidity will definitely breed inflation. That is, you see inflation happening in the financial markets, right? So if you want to see how inflation moves, instead of seeing it as one thing, like one indicator, I want you to see it in three baskets, right? So goods, services, and assets. When is a situation where goods get inflated? That means your, your rice, la, your, your meat, la, the normal, normal stuff that you get day to day. What is a situation when these things, prices move up, the inflation goes up? The higher chance is when your home currency crash. It's not when there's increase in liquidity, right? So Venezuela, Iran, you know, even Turkey today, they're going through some problems. It's when their home currency crash, okay, let's say Sing dollar crash, uh, and suddenly our currency is so small, but we still got to import all these things, right? So all the things that we import become very expensive. So that's when the goods prices will move up and inflation will move up accordingly based on that, okay? Honestly, like, today you make a little bit more money, you start to stock rice, man. You start to, <laughs> you start to buy canned beans, man. Wow. You don't do that, right? So, so, so that is the highest probability where you see goods prices move up, where you see inflation pressure on goods is when home currency crash. Okay? For services, it, it's a relatively stable situation. Of course, when uh, home currency crash, you know, um, when goods move up, when goods become more expensive, services will move along. Generally, they have some in tandem. But the real upward pressure of services really comes on 
the affordability of the local population. That means the median wage is more aligned to services price increase. Okay, we will, we will not expand it here today, but you just think about it, right? You go Wampo today, uh, you can still find $5 bubble, right? But you, you live in Tampines, maybe $10, $12 bubble, right? These days, uh, and you, you go to Orchard, right? There's only a $50 hairdresser, okay? Or $100 stylist, right? So it is very regional. And you start to see, but it's the same thing like cut hair. Okay, okay, so if, if you're a stylist, you're listening, don't, don't, don't blame me. Don't flame me, okay? But, but the reality is, it's a haircut. But why is it in different places, it is priced differently? So services are very tied to the local population. Unless it's exportable services like banking, like law, like business management, those things are different. Okay, Most services are very tied to the local population. So the median wage of the particular population is the underlying indicator as to why inflation will move up for services. But financial assets, the underlying causality in my view, uh, the underlying causality is when there's increase in liquidity. When interest rates come down, when there's a lot of money slushing around, they all move into property market, they move into the share market, they move into the Bitcoin market, they move into cryptocurrency, they move into all these kind of investment assets out there. And you see, right, you, you don't need me to tell you, right, through this pandemic, you learn it. It's very, very clear, right? So, that is why I am a strong believer, okay? Don't, don't, don't go and look at all the edge or what other weird people are saying. I'm a firm believer that when there's an increase in liquidity, it will cause inflation, right? And it cause inflation in the financial markets first, not inflation in like goods or services. What does it mean? It means that when there's an increase in liquidity, generally all assets will move up. Inflationary pressure on financial markets, right? It's a good time for you to make money. You know, if you're investing and trying to be more opportunistic. But at the same time, it also means that your property prices become more expensive because property is not included in the CPI. And I reiterate, the CPI is Consumer Price Index, which is the leading indicator of inflation, right? So all the numbers that's going on the news, are 5%, 2%, 1%, are all called CPI, okay? But different people are measuring it differently. And you should care about it. Why you should care about it? Because it affects your property prices. And because it is not part of the CPI, it looks like, oh, okay, my CPI, okay, no problem. But it affects your HDB price. Can't you tell? Right? So like it or not, increase in liquidity will cause inflation, but primarily in the financial assets class, okay, which is your shares, your property, and all that jazz. Whether or not will that spill over into the real economy? Will, will that make goods more expensive? Will that make uh, services more expensive? Uh, I, I don't know. Okay, I, that's, I don't know enough to, to give you that kind of inference. But at least uh, in the future, when we start to see People do that, right? We see governments do that, increase liquidity, you know, uh, pump more money, lower interest rates. Then you will know that, okay, okay, going forward, the financial markets will, you will come back, will, will, will move up, right? So I think that's kind of where, where we are. Which is also why I'm a firm believer that as interest rates come up, the financial markets will shrink, okay? So uh, that is, that is uh, we will see, we will see by the time this episode goes out, the Fed will have already adjust interest rates. So by then you will know, right? If interest rates go up, you, you see if the financial market shrinks. Okay, that is, uh, that is what I believe in. Huh? Which brings me to the third pandemic financial lessons for all you Singaporeans listening. And that is, I believe that a lot of Singaporeans have a highly concentrated portfolio. Not in a sense of just um, investments. Uh. I, I know a lot of people, uh, they invest in you know, REITs in Singapore, invest in dividend stocks in Singapore, and they're very iffy about investing abroad. You know, but, but that's a whole different discussion. We've done a lot of that ongoing. But what I have recognized in this process of this pandemic is that your job is tied to a Singapore company. Your flat is tied to a Singapore company. Your kids go to a Singapore education institution. Your investments are also tied in Singapore. And your retirement is tied in CBF. Right? So, so, <laughs> so it's not technically a problem. It is just an observation. Right? So as an observation... When you realize that Singaporeans have a very highly concentrated portfolio, all in Singapore, you ask yourself, is this risky? Uh, I would say, yeah, a bit, a bit risky, right? which is why more and more uh, of us, we are investing abroad, we are investing in different, different countries. So you can be working for a Singapore company, right? So your, your income is invested in a Singapore company, right? So essentially the underlying um, success of your life or your income is the underlying success of the Singapore company, which is the underlying success of Singapore, right? So you're already tied to Singapore's success, right? And your retirement money is also tied to the CPF, which is tied to GIC, which is, you know, <laughs> you, you get the idea, lah, huh? So 
what I'm saying going forward is that maybe more and more Singaporeans we should explore a, a broader you know, a horizon abroad, right? Maybe we can work for other companies, right? Don't need to be a Singapore company. We don't, maybe we don't even need to work in Singapore, right? But we can still uh, get a flat, right? We can still, you know, put our money in CPF because we have to, right? But can we uh, put some money from CPF to invest abroad, right? So I mean, there are a lot of options these days, but I want you to realize that a lot of us, we have a very highly concentrated portfolio in Singapore. And what does that mean? When you have a highly concentrated portfolio, if the underlying portfolio moves up a lot, you see a lot of success. Well, you make a lot of money ma, because it's a concentrated portfolio. We have established that with uh, Chris Santo from Rethink Wealth. right? So go and check out one of the earlier Chills episode. If you have a very concentrated portfolio, if the underlying investment, which is Singapore, okay, because it's Singapore company, la, Singapore house, la, Singapore retirement fund, la, it's Singapore stock market, la, everything, right? So <laughs> the underlying factor is Singapore. If Singapore does well, you do very, very well. Financially, emotionally, you know, everything, career, everything, which is leads to financial, right? Which is why there's a big bunch of the boomers and the pre-boomers. Who, who do you call that? What, what do you call them? The pioneer generation, the Madeka generation, okay, and the boomers. Huh? They are so so on Singapore as an idea. But let us not forget that Singapore at that point in time is a growth company. It's a growth stock, right? And just so happened this growth stock worked. That's why all of them like, whoa, you know, they do very well. They growth stock. But now as a, as a, if you look at it from a company's angle, right? Singapore is a matured company. We're struggling to even have a very concentrated strategy because there are so many interests, so many people that want to do so many different things. And, you know, uh, we want to go green, but we have a very big oil and gas industry here. You know, for a very long time, we didn't want to go into the vices. Then after that, now we go into the vices, we have gambling, but we, at the same time, we try to tax the people. You know, there are many, many different things because it is more established. Let's just put it this way. This is a natural order. It's not a moral judgment. Natural order where when a company becomes bigger, it becomes matured, there are a lot of incentive structure, there are a lot of incentive problems, right? So, um, which is why a lot of people, when they work at MNCs, they're very unhappy, right? Because you are a small fry within this big pond and they have a lot of different things going on. So it's the same idea when you look at Singapore today. It is a matured company, okay? It's a matured country. It is not a growth stock, so if you are very, very concentrated in a matured company, at best, you get dividends. At best, you get very good dividends. Okay, so dividends like CPF money move up, la, your REITs portfolio continue to grow, la, you know, your income move in tandem along with the medium wage, la, right? but you're not going to see bursts. You're not going to see like fast-moving growth anymore. So for all of you that are okay with that, great, go ahead. Singapore's a great place. But for all of you that are trying to experience that massive growth, you want to see that change in your life, then you really got a question in a matured company, which is Singapore, okay? Singapore Inc. Huh? Is this the place to be? Huh? That's, this is the question mark, okay? Of course, if you're in a growth areas like tech, la, like whatever, la, you know, if you're in those areas, then okay, everywhere you go, you're, you're growing because there's a broader order. But I'm talking about most of us, right? People in accounting, la, people in law, la, business management, you know, uh, your, your services sector, your, your hawker, you know, all these people, right? They are not in growth sectors, you know. They, they, are, they are essentially all their performance and, they, and their progress is tied to the growth of the country. Right, so the growth of the country is in a matured situation and we are going through that process. So Singaporeans having a very concentrated portfolio on Singapore, you got to question yourself, is this the way to go for you? If it is, cool, good, okay? So yes, I think these are the three core, core pandemic financial lessons that we can recognize and we can learn, right? Because through this situation, some things become a lot, a lot clearer. I'm sure there are many others and all these others, you can come to a Telegram group and share with us. But I'm going to sum it up today. Number one, that is, we all have many needs, but there are many mediums to go about achieving it. Avoid putting in the needs and the wants because a lot of people, when they look at wants, it's an evil bucket. And once you put anything as evil, you don't try it, you don't test it, you don't stretch your boundaries, you will not be able to experience it in a fuller fashion. So with that, I want you to see it with needs plus mediums. And in Singapore, in this two years lockdown, I'm sure you recognize that there are many mediums to go about achieving the varied needs that you have. Whatever that you used to do, um, there are new mediums to go about achieving those needs, right? 
And point number two is that increase in liquidity will definitely lead to inflation. Not inflation that is being tracked like the CPI, which is what Singapore's tracked, not, not including housing, not including shares, not including investments. But you see the increase in liquidity makes capital very cheap and it push up all the assets. All the financial assets out there are being pushed up, even your Bitcoin, even your cryptocurrencies, right? So this is something that I think we all should be very aware of going forward. In the future, when you see central banks, you see any you know, government try to increase liquidity, then you know, okay, now financial assets are about to move, right? Because there's more money here. Point number three is Singaporeans, a lot of Singaporeans have a very highly concentrated portfolio in Singapore. You work in Singapore, your house is in Singapore, your retirement in Singapore, everything is Singapore, right? So in a mature company, which is where Singapore is, concentrated portfolios only give you dividend. Is it okay with you? If it's okay, great, good for you. If you are seeking high growth, high progress, then maybe Singapore as a place to put all your eggs in a basket may not be the place to be for you. And with that, I hope you learned something useful today. See ya! Hey, I hope you learned something useful today and truly appreciate that you took time off to better your life with the financial coconut. Knowledge is that much more powerful and interesting when shared, debated and discussed. Join our community telegram group, follow us on our social, sign up for our weekly newsletter. We are doing a weekly newsletter reboot. We are going to have a lot of information within the newsletter. Everything is in the description below. And if you love us and want to help us grow, definitely share the podcast with your friends and on your socials. Also, if you have any interesting thoughts you want to share or you know someone that we would like to hear from, reach out to us through hello at the financial coconut.com with that have a great day ahead stay tuned next week and always remember personal finance can be chill clear and sustainable for all okay today is the last episode of 2021 uh, i hope you you found it useful you know um I, I some of these points actually all of these points i i spent a lot of time to think about it um, because I, I think it's it's a worthy discussion and there are a lot of underlying discussions that we can have, you know, that don't need to sound very, very complicated, like very economics, you know, too complicated. But there are actually a lot of lessons that we can draw, right? From nation to business to investments to personal life. You know, you can kind of put some of these things together and you can you can see it in a in a rounder fashion rather than harp on um, certain beliefs or certain, you know, things that are being peddled in mainstream media. Uh, but, but that's it for, for this year and I want to give you a, a real thank you, a heartfelt gratitude for, for you staying around with the podcast. I know we've been through quite a process trying different, different content. Not all will fit your palate, uh, but you know, even though it does not fit your palate, you still stay around, so that's great. <laughs> and uh, for all the people that you know that may have kind of like fizzled out from the podcast a little bit, Hey, go ahead and give them a nudge. Say, you know, we're, we're you know, let them know that we're we're trying to reposition Tuesday's episodes. Right. So going forward, we will have a lot more content in the coming year, right? So we're working with uh, different financial institutions. We are working with agencies, you know. So, so a lot of things are coming and we're gonna keep creating more content for you. So if you have any other interesting things you want us to talk about, email to me, hello at the financial coconut.com, um, DM us on Instagram or Telegram or, or whatever you right. But all that being said, I want to thank you for making this happen. Right? Two years of pandemic and I started as a nobody. Now I am kind of somebody, right? So that's great. Good stuff. Thank you. And uh, keep helping us grow. And I hope you keep learning along together with the community, right? Together with us. All right. Next week's episode will be the first episode of 2022. Wow. 2022 already. I'm getting 30 years old this year. And in 2022, I'm gonna, we're going to start the episode with what underpins your goals. Okay, which is important, right? Because I think uh, we've talked about what what is uh, the best goal setting practices. You know, what what are some things to look out for? And we've done it last year. I don't want to keep doing it the same thing. This year, I feel like we should take some time to look at what underpins our goals. Like, why do we set these goals? Like, what is our incentive uh, structure and what is our underlying desire? Right. So I, I have consolidated some thoughts on this, and it's been it's been years in the making. You know, so so I hope you find it useful, and that's not to say that you definitely have to change your goals, but that is to say that uh, knowing these things will help you become more astute in setting your goals and setting your themes and trying to understand why you want certain things. Okay, so have a great year ahead. I wish you all the best, and I see you next year. Bye.